Hello, everyone. I'm John Lin, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. And we're excited to bring you an interview about a topic that I think we all love and hate. I don't know. I don't know how to describe prior OS, but I think we all have an experience with prior OS that makes it a challenge. So hopefully today we can put a, a little bit of a face to it with a, a caregiver and her experience with her son as a patient, and also with an expert from Cover My Meds and some solutions, hopefully, to some of these problems. So today we're here with Miranda Gill. She's Senior Director of Pro Provider Services and Operations at Cover My Meds. And we also have Tanya C. She's a caregiver for her son. Welcome, Miranda. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'm excited to learn more about your experience, Tanya. But before we start, uh, Miranda, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and Cover My Meds? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for having me with you today. Um, and Tanya, honored to be here with you as well. My name is Miranda Gill, and I'm an advanced practice nurse by training. And currently, I have the opportunity to serve as the Senior Director of Provider at Cover My Meds. And if you're not familiar with Cover My Meds, it's a healthcare IT company that helps solve uh, some of patients' greatest medication access and adherence challenges. And so for us, our solutions seamlessly connect providers, payers, and pharmacists to improve medication access by increasing speed to therapy and reducing that prescription abandonment, which I know we'll talk a little bit more about later today. Awesome, great to have you here, Miranda. And Tanya, it's great to have you here to tell us, tell us your story. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, and your experience with your son in the healthcare system? Sure, absolutely. So I'm Tanya Chadwell. I am an advocacy and recruitment specialist, and I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia, well, a little bit outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a mother to a vibrant, inquisitive, and very active, but very intelligent 14-year-old son who loves basketball, I just decided he's into stock markets and wants to learn more about that. I think he has a, a knack for following young, you know, college graduates who are doing well. And, you know, so I hope he has a great future ahead. He was diagnosed with um, alopecia, you know, several years back. And as a result, because of losing his hair, you know, of course, it can have a drastic and detrimental effect on your self-esteem, as well as you know, making friends in your social environment. And I think it affected him profoundly. Not only that, he had brittle nails as a result. So it took several tests through the dermatologist to come to that diagnosis. And even with that, you know, the doctor said, well, we know about this medication that's out on the market. It seems to have very promising and high yield results. I'm gonna prescribe it to you. And, you know, I think it'll do the job. Um, he didn't make any promises, but he spoke so highly of it that I trusted it would. So we sure. filled out the prescription. I went to the pharmacist, you know, thinking that everything would just work out perfectly. I just go, you know, pay whatever little bit I had to pay and go on my way and we could start the treatment and, you know, get some results. Well, walk up to the pharmacy and they told me, I'm sorry, you weren't approved. You won't be able to receive the meds. And he was a very nice man. He said, well, what we can do is we'll reach back out to the doctor's office and have them fill out some prior authorization forms. And they'll have to, you know, put in reasons why we think that your son is best suited to be able to receive this medication. So right then and there, they made the call and they started the process. But of course, it would have to take some time for us to hear back whether or not it was going to work. So unfortunately, throughout all the hoops and the jumping through the hoops and waiting and trying to be patient, we got a denial once again that he was not going to be able to receive it. So, so what was that like for you? Uh, you know, I mean, hearing the denial and you couldn't get the meds for your son, what, what was that like as a, as a caregiver and a parent? It was definitely very frustrating. Um, it almost made me feel as if I was a failure as a parent because, you know, when a child is dealing with something difficult um, and they're ashamed of it, they don't like talking about it, but they just want it to get fixed. As a parent, you want to fix that. 
You want to be there for them. You want to give them what they need and you want to make it better. And when we go through the steps, you think that that's going to be the outcome, especially when your doctor is giving you so much information that something is out there that does work. So when you get a no and you don't really have a clear reason as to why you can't receive it, it's frustrating, it's disheartening, and then it just makes you feel like you've let your child down. And you know, you feel a little helpless and hopeless, but of course, as most parents do, we try to push, we try to figure it out. Like, you know, do I need to call the, the insurance company myself? Like, tell me what I can do, I'll do it, you know, but definitely heartbreaking um, for both of us. And we just had to revisit and figure out what options we could deal with. And ultimately what they did was say, well, let's try some more medications, you know, we might just get lucky. And honestly, we went through four different options. We, tr we tried it for a month, no results. Try something else for a month, no results. And you know, that can be costly. You're spending one thing, it doesn't work out. You're spending money on something else. And you're thinking, am I wasting my time? Am I on this hamster wheel, but not going anywhere? And definitely, my son was definitely very frustrated. And he had some, you know, emotional moments. And once again, you're heartbroken all over again. You're feeling like a failure all over again. And thankfully, though, with the fourth, you know, option we tried and we started to see some improvement. His hair started to grow back. His nails started to grow stronger because with even with the brittle nails, something as so simple as putting on a shirt would break his nails and yeah. they would break into the meat and they would bleed and it was painful. So to see something to finally give you some results, you know, it, it was a relief, but um, definitely a, a struggle and a long drawn out process. Yeah. And, and basketball's out if you have brittle, brittle nails, right? Uh, like, I, I kill my yeah. fingers and I don't even have that. So. <laughs> you can't grip the ball like you want. Exactly. And you know, like most kids in public, you want to, tough it out and appear as if that, you know, you are strong and you're not going to let it get you down. And that's, you know, especially the society expectations of being a boy and being strong. And he wanted to do all those things, but inside it was, you know, really crushing him. So we just wanted to get it all better and things improved. You know, we have our setbacks and they said there's no guarantee that it won't, you know, recur, but we just do the best we can with every day. Well, and, you know, you mentioned the financial aspect, but I think there's a, a mental emotional one as well. Had you ever heard oh, yes. of prior authorizations before, you know, having this medication denied? Well, I had. My father mentioned it before. He has a chronic condition as well, and he had to go through the same process, but his outcome was better. I think that's what made me so hopeful okay. was that I thought, okay, all I have to do is just fill out these forms and let them, you know, go over it and we'll get an approval and all will be done and we'll be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. So with that, I thought, you know, it wasn't a major deal, but turns out there's just so much more that goes into it that we weren't prepared for and definitely didn't expect to receive a denial. So yeah. it's a lot. My, my heart goes out to everyone out there dealing with the same thing because I can understand how frustrating it can be. So Miranda, why does the doctor not know that Tanya won't be able to be covered by insurance? What, what are the challenges that the doctors are dealing with in this regard? Yeah, so if you think about a prior authorization as a process that gives your health insurance company a chance to review the necessity of the medication, um, it, it would seem that that's really important information to be able to have transparently displayed between the insurance company, the provider, and certainly the patient or caregiver. So it sounds like in Tanya's situation, her doctor may not have had access to a reliable real-time benefit, prescription benefit tool, um, which would notify them when a medication will likely require a prior authorization. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about electronic prior authorization, if it's built directly into a prescription decision support solution within that doctor's EHR, um, mm -hmm. that, that doctor could have initiated the prior authorization request right at the point mm -hmm. of prescribing 
and wow. he or she would have been able to bring awareness to Tanya and to her son while they were still in the office um, that that particular um, milestone or barrier um, was there so that Tanya wouldn't have had to go through that process of arriving to the pharmacy and essentially being shocked at um, you know the the engagement that she described so certain prescription decision support tools um, again they surface that prior authorization requirement or need but they can also surface things like medication cost and cost assistance information. Um, so an example of that would be like a cash price outside of the patient's insurance plan, um, which would then eliminate that need for prior authorization. So um, basically just providing that transparency at the point of prescribing where the doctor could have had the conversation with Tanya if he or she would have had access to that particular information. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I should uh, speak a little for the the insurance side of things, right? I mean, fraud is so rampant. Like prior wow. off in of itself isn't evil. Uh, you know, one of my friends went to the dark side, if you will, and <laughs> she does. <laughs> She's like, it's amazing some of the requests she gets that that really aren't medically justified. And so, the, you know, the prior auth idea in of itself is 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 not bad, right? It, but you know, there's so many nuances to what's being requested and all those things that you know, and and fraud, quite frankly, that insurance companies are trying to go against. So, I mean, just you know, level setting there on the you know, in payer side of things. But uh, you know, it's interesting the technology you describe, Miranda. How, do you have any? idea of how broadly that's adopted and, and maybe what's holding back its adoption? Should it have been part of meaningful use and <laughs> macro and MIPS, uh, you know, which, you know, we are, I'm sure, familiar with, which pushed EHR adoption forward or, you know, what's holding it back? Yeah, so um, today, based on some recent literature, um, about 86% of providers in the ambulatory market have reported that this type of information that you can get through a prescription decision support tool um, would be helpful to them and to their patients, but only about 10% have access to it through their EHR and workflow today. So um, I'll talk about it. I'll answer your question actually kind of in, in three segments because they all are kind of interdependent on one another. So um, when, we, when we talk about electronic prior authorization, um, it, is, it has been rapidly integrated over the last decade because um, you know, historically the typical process for a prior authorization was via fax machine or phone. Um, over the last 10 years, we've moved more to that electronic prior authorization solution, and it has been wildly adopted. However, um, there are providers that do still use that traditional phone and fax channel. So um, we know uh, about 28% of providers said that they do go back or revert back to that non-electronic method when they're handling more complex medications. Mm -hmm. So um, wildly adopted, but there are still situations where providers and their staff go back to more of that manual process. Um, one, of the, one of the great advances that we've seen since the integration of electronic prior authorization is the ability to get an uh, auto determination. So you're able to, in some circumstances, get um, an approval uh, within seconds. Um, so wow. there's an additional benefit there. So when the prior authorization is needed, you're using an electronic format for submission, you, you do have the opportunity in some cases to get that auto determination. Um, we do still see that phone and fax channel, like I said, though, being utilized, and um, we see it more complex and specialty medications. Folks are still reverting to that phone and fax channel. 
Yeah, and I think like you said, uh, I think some of them don't even have access to the electronic one because the EHR vendors have haven't integrated it yet. And and you know, my audience will know better than anyone in the world that uh, if it's not in the EHR, the doctor's not going to do it more or less. So uh, you know, it has to be there. Um, T Tanya, uh, you know, how would this have been impacted your experience if the doctor had known? that the drug maybe you know they would don't know necessarily if it's going to be denied or not if it's a complex case it sounds like yours probably was uh, but at least you knew that hey this has to go through the prior auth process and you know how would that have changed your experience rather than showing up to the pharmacy and like oh sorry Tony can't help you yeah you know, what, what would have been like for you I think it would have made a major difference honestly the reason why is I know that I wouldn't have seen it as the holy grail. I probably wouldn't have put it in the category to think that this is the best thing that's out there. You know, just definitely got to have it. More than likely, the doctor would have, his approach would have been totally different, I'm sure, in how he talked about treatment options that were available and how we're going to approach the care, the level of care. He likely would have mentioned it, but if he knew right off the bat that it wasn't available, he would have just presented me with several options yeah. that were out there and he would have said, okay, these are, you know, so it would have given a wider horizon of options, which would have broadened my expectations. And I wouldn't have solely just expected one thing to be the thing that's going to work. And it's the one most favorite, favorable option. And I just wouldn't have put all my hope into this one treatment. I would have probably had my wider expectations and thought, okay, well, we'll just give these a try because he put a lot of options out there. Didn't really, you know, give a guarantee on anything specifically. And just said, hey, these are a number of options that we, that we have. We don't know, you know, which one is better than the other. So we'll just give one a try. Then it would have, you know, probably given me, um, I don't know, just a, a lesser sense of a, um, hope, not, you know, not less hope, but just my expectations wouldn't have been so high. I would have been frustrated, of course. All of those things, the feelings that I had, it would have not happened. And we would have just tried one thing. If it didn't work, went for another thing. I may have been still frustrated that, you know, we would have had to go through the process. But my expectations would not have been as high as they were. The disappointment wouldn't have been there. And, you know, I think it just would have been better because ultimately, you know, just the, I just wouldn't think that this one thing was the best out of everything else. Yeah, I think, I think managing expectations is is so influential on on happiness and sorrow in life, right? <laughs> Sorry, all of those that. things exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I was just, Tanya, I was just going to point out one really important thing that you mentioned there. Um, setting expectations that is incredibly important and uh, having that conversation, right? If you, if your provider were able to have that prescription decision support information and workflow in the EHR to have that conversation while you, you guys were sitting there face to face or uh, in the telemedicine world these days, um, it, it does give you a chance to ask those questions. Is this the one medication? And in some instances, it might be. But in your case, there certainly were other reasonable alternatives, and you all could have had that fruitful discussion right there at, at the bedside. Yes, it definitely would have been so much back and forth because ultimately we had to go right back in. And, you know, those things come costly. Every time you go for a doctor's visit, whether or not you have great insurance, there's going to be a copay. And then sometimes even that the, you know, you get a bill because it only pays for so much. And, you know, I think we would have been able to, you know, avoid all of that. And it would just prepared the doctor. It would have prepared the doctor to present a wider range of options. and then you know, we definitely wouldn't have had to go through all of those additional steps that we went through. It would have helped a lot. And the thing that you said that kind of is, is fascinating for me is from the doctor's perspective, they know there's four other options outside of the one that they gave you, right? And so in their mind, oh, if you get denied 
all right, we have four other options. They already know that. But you as a caregiver or, you know, if you were a patient, don't know those things, right? So, you know, you, you, your, your fear and your disappointment of a denial is much stronger because you don't know that there's other options. But you could have had that discussion. He could have shared exactly. that information with you if he knew at the point of care and avoided some of that fear because, you know, I've been there before, right, where you're not sure a treatment's going to work or whatever and that you don't know that there's four other options that I could consider. So, I, you know, that's pretty, I think, telling as well. Um, you're absolutely right. Absolutely yeah, right. So, so, Miranda, I mean, it, we all know that e priors authorization and, and doing this at the point of care is better, right? <laughs> like it's, you know, and, and having the immediate answer as much as possible, all of those things, like it just seems so clear that that needs to be done. We all want that. So, but what really needs to be done from, is it a, is it a tech standpoint? Is it a, a governance standpoint? Is it, you know, what's, what needs to be done to really streamline the prior auth process? Is it adopting new technologies? Is it changing of mindset by the payers? What, what do you think needs to be done to really streamline it so that, you know, Tanya doesn't have this experience again? Yeah, I think continued education and awareness of the benefits of prescription decision support solutions, including electronic prior authorization are absolutely key. The technology can be there, it can be the best possible technology out there, but if it's not understood, if it's not adopted and utilized, it doesn't have the opportunity to make that positive impact on the patient. So um, awareness and education are key. And then I think um, just having an understanding of the difference between a prospective prior authorization, which is started at the point of prescribing, versus that retrospective prior authorization after the claim's been rejected at the pharmacy um, is really important because there are clear benefits. Um, obviously, for the patient, um, we know that on average, a uh, patient will get their medication about 13 days sooner when requests are submitted prospectively wow. versus retrospectively. So um, again, just bringing that education and awareness that there are clear benefits that relate to patient outcomes um, from engaging with and adopting these technologies. Yeah, that's amazing. My is, yeah, my guess is a lot of doctors don't even know this is an option because if their EHR vendor doesn't provide it, they, they're not going out searching for it. So I, I think that's, that's that must be part of the problem. Plus, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just, a, a, you know, I think there's a complexity to insurance and multiple providers and multiple locales that, I you know, I think many of them think, oh, can you even solve this problem? Uh, it seems like that's a, a question I hear from some doctors as well. They, they hate it, but they also don't see a, any solution out there. Yeah, I think... Um... We So the integrated option within the EHR and being in workflow is key. And I think we also have the responsibility to overcome some um, broken trust issues that we have from the way that this has, this has been done previously. So um, if you think about the formulary and benefit files, so static files, um, most often at the group level, not at the patient-specific level, um, those aren't always reliable um, and right. providers that have been surveyed pretty frequently have shared with us that they don't actually trust those files. So we also have to do a little bit of regaining of trust um, and getting the providers to want to engage, whether it's in their EHR or through a portal solution that's more web-based if their EHR doesn't have the integration available. Right. Well, it, it's so interesting, the, this piece. Uh, we had the same thing with computer-assisted coding, which is used for coding medical visits. They're like, we burnt so many people out with the early versions that weren't accurate. And then, you know, and then now we got to regain their trust. It sounds like the, you know, some of the early versions of e-prior authorization and at, you know, you know, prior auth at the point of prescribing weren't accurate because the files weren't accurate, et cetera. So uh, 
that's a that's a really good point. Well, I want to thank you both so much for your time, uh, Miranda, for okay. giving us insight into what can be done. I know every doctor wants to improve this because it sucks life out of their day, and <laughs> so that's a good thing if we can help them solve that. And Tanya, thank you so much for sharing your and your thank son's you. story. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. I if you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Have a great day.